hello, friends, and welcome to the monthly lecture. You'll be pleased to know it's sold out, and we've had to turn people away because tonight we have a rising star of uh, political science, but also of uh, general nonfiction writing, Leia Ippi, who is a professor of uh, political theory at the LSE in London and an honorary professor of, uh, in philosophy at the Australian National University. But of course, as we know, she comes originally from Albania. She has degrees in philosophy and literature from the University of Rome, La Sapienza, a doctorate from the EUI in Florence, postdoctoral prize research fellow at Nuffield College. I could go on. Um, she's the author uh, before her better-known uh, books or more widely successful book, She's the author of Global Justice and Avant-Garde Political Agency, The Meaning of Partisanship, which she wrote with Jonathan White. I hope I'm not giving away any secrets to say that he's also your husband. Um, and The Architectonic of Reason. They, they were published by OUP, but her most recent book is the one which uh, brought Leia to a very uh, wide public, uh, public. It was called Free Coming of Age at the End of History, about the seven years before and the seven years after the collapse of communism in Albania, um, which I uh, happened to review for the TLS, for the Times Literary Supplement, and as I was reading it, I was absolutely astonished because she was describing early on in the book about the... Um, dismantling and destruction of the Stalin statue in Duras in Albania at exactly the same time that I was watching the Stalin statue in Tirana being pulled down uh, in a very uh, dramatic set of events. This was a really, really uh, terrific and illuminating book um, about uh, the, uh, the which uh, straddles that the the pivot of the revolution and uh, was uh, extremely well written and in particular apart from being very interesting and amusing and quirky about the period before 1990 it was exceptionally interesting about the seven years after 1990 and was uh, written in a way that I don't think anyone has written about that early post-revolutionary uh, period. If you haven't read it, um, I suggest you all run out and buy one now. It won the Ondatya Prize in Britain, which is a very, very prestigious prize and an extremely difficult prize to win, as I've discovered myself, because I didn't win it. <laughs> and she also won the slightly foxed first biography prize. It's been translated into around 30 languages. Um, Leia is now uh, in the middle of, or coming to the end of, uh, writing a new book, and this will form part of uh, today's lecture on historical injustice, reconciliation, and the role of aesthetic education. She will talk for, I think, about sort of 35 minutes or so. Uh, then we'll have Q&A from the audience, and then everyone is warmly welcome to come downstairs for some wine and cheese in our refectory. Um, so... Uh, it only remains for me to ask Leia to take the stage and give her lecture. Leia. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you very much um, to the EVM for hosting me here and to all of you for coming. Beautiful world, where are you? Asks Schiller in one of his most famous poems called The Gods of Greece. And the main philosophical themes of the poem, which I'm not going to read, are the same that I'm going to discuss tonight. Morality, human nature, alienation, and reconciliation. 
Schiller and I both write in the aftermath of two revolutions, in his case, the French Revolution of 1789, in mind, the Eastern European revolutions of 1989, both of which promised freedom and the opening of a new era of justice for humanity, both of which were marked by a divisive legacy of the past, and in many ways, both of which failed to bring the kind of unity that that Schiller poem, if you've read it, longs for. So our world is just as marked by disenchantment, by disunity, by divisions, by the loss of faith in humanity that Schiller depicts in The Gods of Greece. But I think there is one difference. In Schiller's world, there was hope, if not real, at least imagined. And that hope came in the form of faith in the redeeming power of art and in the capacity, as Schiller describes it, to mediate between feelings on the one hand and moral imperatives on the other. And so, as Schiller puts it in that poem, at some point, exiled gods were exiled, but they still lived in the imagination of the poets. So, my question is, where do we find the gods now, and where do we find reconciliation in the contemporary world? I'm going to try and answer this question by taking you back on a journey from the kind of utopia of classical Greece that Schiller depicts to the dystopia of the life of a woman, my grandmother, who was born in Salonika, contemporary Thessaloniki, in Greece in 1918, shortly before the collapse of the Ottoman Empire, and who died in Tirana, in Albania, in 2005, shortly after the collapse of communism. So I'm going to read some pages from the book, just to give you a sense of the voice of the book, and I will then talk a little bit about the general project, and in the end, uh, attempt to answer this question of reconciliation and unity after historical injustice in societies that are divided by the legacy of the past. So bear with me for about 20 minutes, I'll be reading from the book, and then for the rest of the time I'll just be telling you a bit more about the project and the answer. So now uh, starts the reading. I'm looking for the authority for information concerning documentation of the former state security service, I say, placing myself in front of the first taxi parked on Comuna Parisit. One of the newish busy roads lined up with shops and cafes that connect the center of Tirana to the outer ring of the city. The taxi driver doesn't hear me at first. A gray-haired man in his 70s with a hollowed-out face covered by thick, dark sunglasses, he wears a checked short sleeve shirt and a red Make America Great Again cap with a US flag printed on the side. There's loud music coming from his yellow Mercedes-Benz, a radio station called Top Gold that plays old classics. As I stand in front of the taxi waiting for his reaction, I recognize the sound of the platters, only you, struggling to beat Lady Gaga's Just Dance, emerging from the taxi lined up after his. He's not listening to the music. The station has clearly been chosen to attract a certain kind of customer and instead he's smoking, entirely absorbed in a newspaper. I'm looking for the authority for information concerning documentation of the former state security service, I repeat impatiently. I must sound worried, or at least agitated, because of the tone of my voice prompts the driver to finally detach his eyes from the newspaper, switch off the radio, toss the butt of the unfinished cigarettes outside the car window, and turned towards me with an expression of benign concern. Avash, avash, he says. Take it easy. Take a seat. Who is that you're looking for? Oh. I mutter something, confused by the fact that he's not recognized the official name of my destination. I'm looking for the office with all the files, you know, the former Sigurimi archives. You're not from here, right? he asks once the car engines are on and we're making our way through the busy morning traffic. I wonder what that gave that away. Well, you said you're going to the former Sigurimi archives. That's foreigners' talk. 
There are no farmers here. It's all the same people. My kids, they live in Florida. They come once a year and they all say it looks different. Nonsense. This has changed though, I say, hasn't it? And I point at the interminable line of cars stuck in front of a traffic light just before turning onto Four Heroes Street. They can't drive them, he replies instantly, with the evident satisfaction of someone prepared to crush such a superficial objection. Would be better if they didn't have any cars, wouldn't it? Other things have changed too, I suggest, more to see how he will handle the next objection. Look at all those new trees planted. Ha, you're just like my daughter, he exclaims. She lives in Florida, and she falls in love with the lights and the trees whenever she comes. First they demolish them, now they're planting them. It's all the same, nothing's changed, it's all the same people. Even the trees know it. I'm still thinking about people's favorite game here. Is it the same? Is it different? When he breaks suddenly, and from the car's open window, curses the other drivers on the road, trying to force a U-turn. We've just passed before Etem Bay Mosque, curved left into George W. Bush Street, and we're about to reach the Jeanne d'Arc Boulevard, when he decides to change route. I just remembered something, he explains. You want to go to the new office, right? The one where they recently moved to. They got a grant from the Swedish embassy or the Danish embassy. I shrug. Not sure, I say, pulling out my phone to double check the address. I have here Unit 4, Skanderbeg Military Garrison. I'm starting to find reassuring the formality of the email, as well as the fact that each time I look at it, the content hasn't changed. Come for an appointment on Tuesday, bring an ID, ensure the fee has been paid in advance. I particularly appreciate going through the list of my family members, my father, my grandmother, my grandfather, the way the list of names is offered to me, like some sort of meal deal in a spirit of commercial detachment that is just what I need at this stage. Nothing to feel emotional about, just the secret lives of random group of people to whom I just happened to be assigned at birth. Like specific items of food are assigned a discount. He nods with confidence. Yeah, yeah, that's the one. Are you going there for work or for fun? <laughs> to dig into my grandmother's past, I think. To talk to her to finally bury her, to feel less guilty, to discover how those wartime photos of her, which we thought were lost forever, seem to appear on a random guy's viral Facebook post, to find the truth, to see if my father was a spy, to write a book, to bury him, to see if it's all history or if it's not history yet. Maybe I simply must go without knowing why, to make myself feel better, feel worse or feel the same? For fun, I say. Your documents are all there in JPG format. An employee who has introduced herself as Vera shows me a black Dell laptop that has been ceremonially placed on a working desk in the center of the room. I'm told this is where the researchers come and I've paid the researchers fee. But I can't see any other researchers. Only three other employees sipping Turkish coffee on the tables placed around mine in a semicircle. One of them offers to order me an espresso. I decline and seem to upset her. But Vera points out that I am the Marxist author of a book about freedom, which makes her smile and gesture as if this explains everything. The computer desktop is bare, deep blue, with no icons on the dock other than the three files containing the information I have requested. Top left of the page. Interior Ministry, Directory of State Security and the People's Police Section of Internal Affairs. Top right and almost faded, extremely secret. Further down, a more recent annotation. Fully declassified with decision number 15 taken on 30th of March 2022 by the Authority for Information on the Documents of the Former State Security. Several unintelligible words scribbled by hand in grey pencil. Archive number 531 circled in red and two lines with generalities. Name, surname, Leman Upi. Further down, pseudonym. That line is empty. And though I can't be entirely certain of its meaning, I can feel myself slightly relieved. 
Then immediately after, I start to feel cold and my teeth start chattering. Is there air conditioning? I ask the employees. It's so cold here. They look at me as if the question were rhetorical, a statement uttered mainly out of a desire to communicate something, simply to break the silence. Vera makes a clicking sound with her tongue. It was on this morning, she replies apologetically. But we turned it off because the director said we need to save energy now that we're at war. I must look perplexed. We're in NATO, she corrects herself. That's the same thing. I nod in sign of understanding, then return to the page. My attention is caught by a single word that appears in the middle and has been underlined three times, Greek. It makes no sense, and I continue to scroll until the same word appears again in the next page, where other generalities are recorded. Citizenship, Greek. Name and surname, Leman Uppi. Place of birth, Salonika. Ethnicity, Albanian. Profession, employee of the education ministry, religion, Muslim, registered 29th December 1952, name of referent who performed the registration, Mayor Hayreddin Chinami, reason for the registration, suspected as foreign agent. On page six of the file, the strange word, Greek, recurs again. Leman Uppi, born in Salonika, of Greek citizenship. A series of handwritten instructions also appear. Check if someone with this name and Greek citizenship is registered in file collection one and file collection two, followed by another handwritten note, there is nothing here, with here underlined in red pencil. Citizenship, Greek. Greek citizenship, I repeat to myself, then scroll back to the first page with a doodle where the word Greek is followed by proposal to categorize as 2B. It's kind of bizarre to think of my grandmother as Greek. She spoke French to me most of the time. And although I knew she was born in Salonika, I hardly thought of Salonika as a place, let alone a Greek city. She always referred to it as Salonique la Magnifique. But Salonique la Magnifique has always been for me a site of the mind rather than location on earth. Not space, but time. A time lost before I even knew it or a gallery of mental images, the painting of a stern old man with deep blue eyes, faded photograph in black and white capturing people I did not know and with whom casual resemblances of people I did know were pointed out. And most of the time, Salonique la Magnifique was a combination of sounds from French, Turkish, Ladino, Italian, Spanish, Albanian, and yes, Greek, but only in part. I keep reading the word Greek and it's hard to associate it to my grandmother. Instead, my mind wanders back to my first exam at university in Rome and the wobbly chair on which I was sitting then too, staring at the open page of metaphysics book Zeta, struggling with the question. Signorina, can you remember what Aristotle's term for essence in Greek is? The essence of an entity is what makes that entity be what it is. But how does Aristotle define it exactly? An embarrassing silence follows. Come on, signorina, everyone knows this. We covered it in class. And surely you also know it from your last year in high school. It seems inappropriate to point out that in my country, in my last year of high school, there was a war and everything was shut. And that we never really studied Aristotle. Back then, Aristotle was just the name of my next door Greek Orthodox neighbor. If I really had to think of someone famous called Aristotle, only the second husband of Jackie Kennedy would occur. I roll my eyes, stare outside the window, and decide to count the tiles on the floor. I think that if I fail, the worst that can happen is that I will lose my scholarship and return to where I came from. Come on, signorina. The Greek term for essence is toti and einai. What it is to be, which must be corrected, the examiner insists, to what it was to be since the present tense has crept in later day translations and misled entire generations of Aristotle commentators. Right, I say. It's important, the examiner insists. So was the husband of Jackie Kennedy, I think. Now it turns out that my grandmother's Toti and Einai is also in her past. It turns out her essence, her what it is, or was to be, is Greek. 
I continue to scroll down the file and up again, but at this point my brain has decided to play a trick on me. I'm only able to read the sentences where the term Greek appears. The rest is entirely unintelligible. It might as well have been written in the language of Aristotle. There it is again, at the top of page 7. On the basis of evidence concerning oppositional activity against the people, we propose to categorize 2B and to prepare a preliminary investigation on citizen Leman Upi, born in Salonika, of Albanian ethnicity and Greek citizenship. You always speak Greek when you have a secret. I must have been five or six the first time I uttered those words in anger. It was New Year's Eve and my grandmother's cousin, who used to visit us during the winter, had just arrived on the evening train and one of their animated conversations in French about Salonique la Magnifique had been suddenly interrupted so they could switch to Greek. And I thought of it as a deliberately hostile act intended to exclude me, or even worse, to sabotage my efforts at comprehension. Oh, come on, my grandmother said. When I complained, we were trying to remember the lyrics of a lullaby we used to sing when we were children. It just feels strange to translate it. Greek, I think. Greek, not like Aristotle, more like my grandmother's lullaby. The chair has stopped wobbling and I'm no longer shaking. And I have enough confidence to concentrate again on the open file where another report appears. The reason and the material we dispose for a preliminary investigation, the Vice Colonel DB writes, are the following. The fact that even though Le Manupi has been living here a long time, she continues to carry Greek citizenship and is always hoping to be able to return to Greece. Two. The fact that even though she has been privately advised to apply for Albanian citizenship, she has not only rejected the option, but in the presence of the elements she trusts most, she has expressed hatred towards the People's Republic, the party in power, the Soviet Union, indeed the entire Eastern Bloc. Three, based on what we know from contacts with our collaborator, the Tribune, she has gone even further raising suspicions that she must be an agent of the Greek intelligence services, this for the following reasons. I stop reading. The chills on my spine are gone, but I have now started to feel nauseous. It must be the yellow color of those typeset sheets, or the fact that I've not had breakfast, or the fact that metaphysics Zeta has reappeared. In the presence of the elements she trusts most, I read again, then turn impatiently. Who is this tribune? I say. And what does to be mean? Excuse me, there asks. There's someone called the Tribune mentioned here who has made allegations that my grandmother was a Greek spy. I'm not sure this file is hers. It must be an informant pseudonym, she says. We don't know the real names. If you look carefully, there must be a list. So I scroll up until a page appears entitled List of Collaborators with Pseudonyms. The Tribune, Collaborator 1. White Chewing Gum, Collaborator 2. Wind of March. Collaborator 3. The employees laugh. They're all like that, they say, the pseudonyms of collaborators. One wonders who came up with them. If you file a request for further information as a family member, you can find the real names of the informants, Vera, who has noticed my distress, points out. Why did you come as a researcher? Then you would have known if you were a family member who was behind the whole thing. Was, I think. Is it all in the past? Her what it was to be? I look at the screen again, and I'm unable to read past the word Greek. Do you want to find out who it was? There I insist. I can show you how to fill the forms, and here's the list with the fees. End of reading. I just so part um, philosophical text and part political history and in part a family saga, my current book is provisionally entitled Indignity and is an effort to explore the moral and the political meanings of dignity in connection to questions of truth, reconciliation, historical injustice, and as you'll see in a minute, the connection between facts and fiction. And it follows the first 35 years of life of a central character, and you will understand in a minute why it's a character, called Leman Upi, who appears in my last book in part uh, as my grandmother, and uh, who is presented in the book as someone who embodies an idea of freedom that is a little bit different from the other two ideas that I explore, the more negative and positive uh, freedom, where she has this distinct conception of uh, freedom as moral agency, 
And so with this current book, what I try to do is to continue this analysis of freedom by exploring further what this capacity for moral agency looks like and how and why it is the core of human dignity and how it's reflected but also distorted in the political projects of the 20th century, uh, all of which try to build institutions that in part renegotiate the legacy of the past and in part confront the vision of a new world. Uh, my grandmother was, as you heard from the summary, born in Salonika, where her grandmother was a former Ottoman uh, administrator, had been exiled by Sultan Hamid. She was an Albanian origin, but at home everyone spoke Greek. She went to the French Lycée, and until the age of 20 she'd never traveled to Albania, where she went in the 1930s, where she worked for a bit in the Albanian administration, met my grandfather, was part of the liberal progressive intelligentsia, and where uh, my grandfather, after the arrival of communists to power, was arrested for agitation and propaganda in collaboration with the Anglo-Americans and went to prison for 15 years while she was deported and uh, efforts were constantly made to recruit her as a Secret Service agent. In the book, uh, and, and so the book uh, tries to tell the story of this character by relying on two temporal narratives which are interspersed. The first one, which is the one that you've just heard, is in the first person, in the present, and narrates a series of visits to the Secret Service archives and uh, talks about the dilemmas and the discussions around opening the files related to my family. Uh, and the second perspective in the book is one in the third person where an uh, author tries to reimagine what it might have been like for someone who was born in Salonika just before the collapse of the Ottoman Empire to have lived this kind of life and then to come travel to Albania, explores the various reasons for why she moves, what the political circumstances of the interwar period look like in this particular context in the Balkans, and where she becomes an adult and tries to become to fight for her life and to become her own person, eventually also uh, confronting the regime. So in the first person narrative, the life of Le Mans is traced by looking at the depositions of the people who are spying on her, mainly. Uh, so it starts with this visit to the Secret Service archives, but then really looks at what was being said about her in the files. And uh, in the second perspective, it's reconstructed with the help of other historical documents like letters, memoirs, newspaper articles of the periods, government documents, diaries, and so on. So in the first case, in the first-person narrative, the question, is, the question of dignity is closely connected to the issue of truth and the factual search for truth. So who was uh, surveilling my grandmother? What motives did they have? How were they collaborating with the regimes? And that's because in many societies like Albania, divided by the legacy of the past, there is a kind of belief that knowing the truth of what happened to this particular person will in somehow bring reconciliation to, uh, to, to the families who have suffered from, from persecution and to society more generally. And, uh, and that will finally help restore both the dignity. So this factual search for truth is presumed to restore both the dignity of the victims and the uh, dignity of an entire society in a way. And only after that has been done, so the argument goes, can the next generation go on to uh, confront the question of reconciliation. What my book tries to show, and you will hear in a minute why, is that this only works if there actually is a truth to find and if you can trust the mechanisms through which that truth is transmitted. And uh, at uh, the end of the book, what actually emerges is that this is a much more complicated question than it appears at the beginning when you go to the files with this naive idea that you will find the truth about your grandmother. I was initially going to write about her just in the first person, and the book would, was going to be just a reconstruction of her life based on the Secret Service archives. But when I started working on the book proposal, I traveled to Albania to visit the archives and gather as much information as I could. And during the visit to this secret uh, uh, service and looking at the files, I came across a number of errors in her files that didn't really seem to make sense to me. So one of the most puzzling of all was that in the file I was given as my grandmother's file, she was reported as dead in 1953. And uh, this made no sense because my grandmother died, as I said earlier, in 2005. And... Uh, when I asked the experts about this, they said, oh, you know, this is very common, it happens all the time. Um, sometimes uh, people inserted fake death certificates to save someone from being surveilled, so maybe she had a family member who worked close to the uh, people who were working for the secret services, and so he just introduced a fake death certificate. Sometimes just things, errors slip, and... Uh, 
my mother said that she uh, believed that she, my grandmother had a cousin who was very close to Enver Hoxha, the then communist dictator, and so maybe to try and save her, he had also inserted this fake death certificate. In the end, I started doing, the, the whole process was digging more and digging more and trying to find out where not just this, in this inaccuracy, but other inaccuracies. Her husband was reported as dead during the war at one point. Um, a number of things didn't quite match up with her descriptions. So I discovered, doing more research, that another Le Manuti, who was born in the same city, in Salonika, in the same period, came from the same family background, so relatively wealthy, affluent Ottoman elites, had been placed under surveillance at exactly the same time. So since the information I was reading about her was sometimes very accurate and sometimes completely unrelated and completely irrelevant, I started to doubt that there was actually a filing error in the system, and so, in fact, I wasn't always reading about my grandmother. Sometimes I was reading reports on my grandmother's life, and sometimes I was reading reports on someone else's life, random person I had never met. And uh, this was actually later confirmed doing further research by reading up about the life of this collaborator, the Tribune, who I just mentioned, who is, in the end, was executed for misleading the state in the reports about these two people. So, uh, or at least, he didn't say that it was about these two people, but he was executed for giving fake inform false information to the state. So I discovered that I had kind of gone to the archives to find out more about my grandmother, but what uh, there was, and to, and to try and kind of record her life and reconstruct the meaning of her life and to reflect on her dignity, but uh, I discovered just another layer of interpretation and with it, another character. I also found out, doing more research than about this other character, that this other Le Mans, not my grandmother, died alone and left no descendants. So she had no descendants who could record her life or find the truth about her. And uh, she, there was no one who in a way could reflect on the meaning of her life and on her dignity. So I decided that uh, since I thought her life also deserved to be recorded somehow, I decided to kind of adopt her and to imagine what her life would have been like under these circumstances, moving, making these same transitions, moving from the collapse of empire to interwar Albanian. And so I thought that since the characters were similar enough to confuse the spies, I would absorb that confusion in the manuscript, in the book, and uh, blur the characters that I found in the files, in the story of the book, so that in the end, instead of having to choose on whether the book was more facts or more fiction, it would actually be a way of thematizing the relationship between facts and fiction and history and imagination in the case of historical injustice. So instead of, uh, as I say, using, uh, trying to sort out the life of one character from the life of another, I would use this incident as a way of explicitly thematizing the theme of dignity in its connection to the question of um, truth. And so I try and find a way through the book of tracing continuities between literary imagination and historical factual reconstruction. So in a way, uh, and this leads me now to going back to where I started with the gods of Greece and, and the Schiller theme, this kind of hybrid character that is at the center of my book, uh, who is part fictional and part not, is an interesting figure through which to explore the themes of historical injustice and reconciliation, but also this more general question of dignity that Schiller raises in The Gods of Greece and how to engage with division um, and conflict in the present and where to look for reconciliation. The life of both of these characters, or the life of this hybrid character, is one of struggling and suffering, and both of them try to assert their moral agency in these complicated uh, circumstances of the 20th century. And their morality in both cases is revealed in a sort of human struggle to, uh, to, to come to terms with external constraints and with their efforts to kind of resist power and ideology. And uh, both of the, those lives, in a way, show that these struggles have costs and come with very little reward, except for the reward of someone who reconstructs that life and tries to explain what the meaning of it is ultimately. But the existence of that struggle, in a way, suggests that reason can afford to elevate itself over empirical circumstances and also find some power to fight manipulation, ideology, and, and propaganda. 
And so uh, my dilemma when I started the book was the same as Schiller. How do you find reconciliation in a world that is still pervaded by uh, ideology, propaganda, manipulation, where you still can't trust the mechanisms of uh, history transmission and the ways in which we tell the truth and the various interpretations about um, life? And uh, through what mechanisms can moral ideals provide political reorientation? I think Schiller, in the aftermath of the French Revolution, saw something that is still with us today, which is that, as I say, the interpretation of facts is always the result of ideological manipulation and vulnerable to propaganda. And what we know is always, what we access is always someone's uh, propaganda. So where do you find hope? And what the book tries to do is go back to the theme of the gods of Greek and to suggest that actually maybe there was something to Schiller as a kind of forward-looking vision of what we should all be aspiring to do, which is to turn to art and to the power of imagination in reorienting human beings um, towards morality. And so, in the end, I conclude the book with this reflection where I say, well, does it really matter who this character that you've been all reading about is? What matters aren't the facts about a specific person, but the kind of moral light that they shed on the world and the orientation that they provide. And in that sense, a generic character who is half real and half reconstructed with the help of someone's imagination is still a particular that connects readers and the public to a kind of universal that is in all of us, which is what Schiller was trying to indicate in that uh, poem. And so reconciliation isn't really about reaching the end of a process, but finding a way of engaging with the conflicts of the present. And it's not always about finding a truth that is given to us out there, just ready to be unearthed, but trying to reimagine our poli political and moral and social relations with others and using that reimagining to criticize our reconstruction of the past. So just to wrap up, my answer in the end is the same as Schiller's one. Uh, Schiller says, and I quote, the instrument of political education is art because art tries to be free from what is established by human convention. And so if, only, uh, if Schiller is right and only in art can one free oneself from propaganda, from manipulation, from ideology, from biased ways of telling stories and the truth, it makes sense to think about an effort to reconstruct someone's life, including someone's grandmother's life, including someone's life as given by the Secret Service archives, and to reflect on the meaning of their dignity, not just with the help of the historical truth about that person, but also with a kind of vindication of their humanity through a combination of also literature and philosophy. So that's it. Thank you, Leia. I, I, I had the fortune of being able to uh, read this uh, earlier on, um, and so uh, my sense is there's there's a lot to tease out of this, a lot to a lot to parse. Um, I was struck by your sense at the beginning that Schiller was left with a sense of hope, which you described uh, why, why at the end. But the implication was, when you were talking about Schiller, who was f famously became very, very depressed about the French Revolution, uh, having, initially w having initially welcomed it, um, that, uh, uh, that he found in art and its educative um, capacity uh, a way forward a way for the for the future now at the beginning of the talk you seem to su suggest that we don't have that hope the end of the talk you were trying to suggest to us that actually there is a way of finding that hope given the the uh, uh, overall rather grim circumstances that we are experiencing at the moment and the way that many of us are catastrophizing about the future. Do you think that Schiller's experience is really, we can really replicate it today? Or do we have to be more realistic about 
what we see around us. Yeah, so it's interesting, and you're right that uh, there is this tension, and I start by saying actually Schiller had hope and we don't, and I end up by saying actually we also have to have hope. And in part, I think, because my conclusion about hope is more of a call, so hope is more of a kind of imperative. It's more like a categorical imperative that we have to have, that we can't afford to give up. But in the end, I think we are, uh, if we think about each of us in our circumstances, so Schiller in his world and us in our world, both of us are kind of coping with the, uh, this delusion and this idea of disillusionment after, in the case of Eastern European societies after 1989, with this great hope and this transformative events and this opening of this new era of freedom, and that turning in a type of fanaticism that doesn't enable them to accommodate the plurality and the complexity of the world. And that's kind of what Schiller was also worried about when he thought about the French Revolution. These ideas are all great ideas, but when they meet reality when they turn into history, they become tragedies because they come with a kind of fanaticism and that's what we need to think about. How can we soften the edges around this uh, um, appropriation of these ideas? And he ends up by saying, well, maybe art is the only thing we have because art offers us this way of elevating ourselves morally, but not in a way that is fanatic, not in a way that comes with this kind of dogmatic commitment to these moral ideas that must become true. It enables us to understand the shades and the nuances of the world. And I think it's something like that is particularly apt in societies that are divided, I think, where uh, the only way in which you can begin to construct something is to comp to, to, to render the reconstruction of reality more complex than any given perspective makes it to be. And in a way, I think where Schiller ended up, which was, well, art can do that because art enables you to inhabit all these different perspectives, is where I end up by saying, I have to adopt these different voices in the book. And this plurality of voices is maybe the only way that we can think through and past these very stark divisions, in particular in societies that are really still constrained by the legacy of the past and by these, as I started by saying, you know, the communists, are they still communists? Are the same, are these, uh, can, can there be reconciliation? It's the same, is it the same people? Is it not the same people? Has something changed? Has something not changed? And the only way that you can actually navigate those discussions is I think by just inhabiting all the different perspectives, by just looking at the world from the point of view of a secret service agent, from the point of view of someone who was persecuted, from the point of view of a party official, from the point of view of a descendant. And I don't think there is another form of expression that has that capacity other than literature and in art more generally. So in terms of your, of your writing and how you, how you approach uh, the writing, and I was particularly interested in this, up until the point that you discovered that there was a second Lemon Ippi um, whose experience was parallel but entirely different and yet the same. Uh, were you struggling with how to, with how to write the book and, and, and address that issue of complexity? Was the discovery of the second Lemon Ippi a sort of uh, light bulb going off in terms of how you were going to construct the, the book because as you describe it there it turns into a very different book at that moment. Mm. Yeah it was both liberating and constraining and, and disappointing it was both exhilarating and disappointing it was very disappointing because when you think you're reading about your grandmother and then you suddenly think well actually it's not my grandmother and then it confirmed it gets confirmed that it's not your grandmother and you're reading someone else there is an ethical question that has to do with how do you approach someone's life. This is very personal, detailed information that concerns that someone's day-to-day -day movements, what they said to their colleagues, and okay, the person is dead, but there is still an ethical question of how you handle the dead and you know how you talk about them. And especially for the book that for a book that is about dignity, it's a very important question: how do you treat your material in a dignified way? And uh, and in fact, you know, if the dead didn't have dignity, you wouldn't have that kind of book. It's because we think that dead people have dignity that you can actually have this kind of project. It makes sense. So in, in terms of the general project, it was both, as I say, difficult, but liberating in another way, because before that I was trying to just put together all the different pieces of information about my grandmother's life and was disciplined by that. Whereas after, when I thought, okay, now I have this generic character, so what I need to make sure is that the generics are in place. And so when I say in my historical chapters. She was walking in Thessaloniki in 1931 and stopped for a cafe and ate this ice cream. The ice cream was there, the cafe was there, everything would have been there at that time. So the work became a lot, but in a different kind of way. It wasn't the work of 
putting together my grandmother's life, it was more of work of reconstructing an era. And so then the book gave me more, this discovery gave me more methodological clarity because it enabled me to approach the writing process with this very strict uh, disciplining principle, which was, I will write, if I say there's this road, the road really needs to have been there and would have been called that at that time and this cafe would have been there, even though I don't actually know who the particular characters that ended up going to that cafe, but the conversations would have been the ones that they would have had and so on. So it became a different kind of uh, book as I say, easier in one way and maybe personally also a little bit more liberating because you don't have this weight of your ancestors all the time and you're, you're thinking about someone who is more detached, but more difficult, I guess, in a more research way because it becomes the work of the historians. And as the historians here know, it's a lot of work and sometimes very hard to make these decisions on what do I keep, what do I include, what do I exclude, and you get lost and you have all these false tracks. And so yes, go down rabbit holes, I think, is the phrase. Um, uh, you, I'm not sure if you argued it there, but you argued in the version that I, I read about uh, what is the essence of freedom. And you conclude that freedom is an inner freedom. It's, it's about what you feel and what you think, notwithstanding external constraints. But isn't that, as you describe it, and knock me down if you will, isn't that a uh, call in some respects to inactivity, mm. that as long as you retain your own sense of your dignity mm. and, and your freedom of thought, you don't have to engage with, with the outside world mm. and project it into the outside world. Yeah, I think there is that risk, and uh, and the way I try to do it in the book, there is another character who I didn't have time to talk about, who is my grandmother's aunt, who uh, ha has a similar view of freedom, but is more of a kind of classical Stoic, and she commits suicide, because for the Stoics, suicide is the paradigmatic uh, instance of freedom exercise. You just kill yourself, and you have... The and and there is a whole critique of the in the book of, of that um, mode of manifesting your internal freedom, which is in some ways detached from responsibility and divorced from how you think about your relationship to other people. I don't think in the end, uh, I don't think that there is a kind of demonstration of what dignity consists. And that's why the book is called Indignity rather than Dignity, because what you have is actually constant exposures to indignity and constant attempts to undermine someone's dignity. And all you see is the struggle. And in a way, I th what I think now is that, uh, yes, there is a risk that this inner freedom becomes uh, indifference to the world or apathy, or, but it doesn't have to be that. It all depends on how you think about social relations. And the project of the book more generally is to actually have a more, uh, more nuanced political understanding of dignity and, in fact, to try and think about what does dignity mean both in the person but also in a society as it tries to claim autonomy and independence in this context of these new states emerging from the collapse of the empire. And so there's a, this, the discussion around dignity is conducted at many different levels. Some are more personal, some are more political, some are more micro, some are more macro. And I don't think there is a kind of overarching answer that is in my count book, but not in this one. <laughs> so uh, and, and so this, I think what the reader is left with is more the sense of it's more the, the dignity is manifested more in the attempt to be a moral agent and not so much in the outcome and in the kind of guaranteed conclusion. Okay, now before I hand it over to the audience, I've got a very quick, simple question. Was your father a spy? <laughs> <laughs> not, th not, no, nothing has come out of from the files that I have seen, but I'm not, you know, I, don't, I can't say no, because <laughs> I haven't seen all the files, and, and, we, and we never know the whole truth, so. It's <laughs> very true. Yeah. Um, let me throw it open to the audience. Anyone has questions for Leia? Uh, Michael. to lead off, but um, I've got no difficulty at all um, identifying art as a source of hope. I mean, I'm with you 100%. But there is a huge tradition of which you'll be aware, and I think um, we've already touched upon it, that regards this as a kind of passive aestheticism that abandons the struggle to change the world collectively for the sake of hopeful ex individual experiences. And surely that's behind Marx's remark about people have interpreted the world. The point is to change it. I mean, 
to what extent are you walking away from that tradition and and essentially saying you're with Schiller in this one? I, I, I'm trying to figure out how you relate to this tradition, um, which I found a great, I've had to struggle with because I'm I'm on the other side. I'm with I'm with art, but the the enemies of art have been the proponents of revolution, and they've had a very strong case. Collective social action is the only way in which we can grant dignity not to individuals but to all classes of human beings. So there's a big there's a big debate here. I just wonder where you position yourself and how your own thinking is evolved. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so I mean, I think I'm sitting on the fence with that one because I'm not, uh, I'm not, I haven't gone full circle to just the advocating, you know, aestheticism and art. I think, I think of art as a type of political commitment as well. And so all of these interventions that I think of as artistic interventions also have a political point. In this case, a point that they make about how to think about historical injustice and how we negotiate the legacy of the past and what we can hope or we can't hope to find. There, there are theses behind all of these things which I'm not unpacking philosophically, but which definitely drive me to position myself in this debate in one way rather than in the way of those who say, no, actually you really need to find the truth in the archives that you really can't make up someone's life. You really have to be respectful to the facts on the ground. And I'm saying that, as I started saying with Schiller, that when there is still injustice in society, any interpretation of the facts on the ground will be politically manipulated, as it happens to be in Eastern Europe right now by political elites who often appropriate the files, the discussion around truth, the discussion around historical injustice and reconciliation for their own purposes. Now, I think that's a political intervention, uh, so I don't think of it as completely detached from what goes on in society. It's more that I think if you decide to speak, and, and, I'm, and again, I'm, I'm, I'm torn because I sometimes speak as a philosopher, sometimes I speak as a writer, and I think there really are different positions and different responsibilities that come with each of these positions. When I think uh, the challenge with writing, say, good literature, is that you have to be convinced even in the position of your worst character. So I have a Nazi character in a book you wouldn't be able to write a good Nazi character if you weren't somehow identifying with them at some level in yourself, because otherwise it would just be sham literature, it would be caricature, it wouldn't be convincing, you wouldn't be able to convey the dilemmas of that character. So what's great, I think, about literature, if you kind of adopt that mode, is that you're able to navigate these different characters and to be as charitable as you can to their views of the world and have a conversation between them, which doesn't mean that you agree with them, that you sympathize with that position, but that you give it as fair a shot as you can. Again, I think that's a political perspective as well. There's a kind of politics that says you have to hear the other side and you have to hear... And um, I, so I think, yes, maybe it puts me at odds with a certain understanding of, you know, Marxism and so on, but I also think there are more charitable interpretations of a Marxist perspective that are more, uh, that can be reconciled more with this, with this take. So I don't have, a, I think, a systematic answer, but really just to say that we each have responsibilities in each of these different social roles, and we can be aware of which social role we're occupying for in what particular discourse and try to be in, inhabit as many of them as possible. Just out of interest on this uh, question, I'll, cu I'll come to the question at the back, but um, it's reminding me a little about the discussions uh, that you have sometimes around drama documentaries about what is fiction, what is non-fiction, what is presented as real and what is presented as fictional. Wi in your book, are you going to be upfront about the amalgamation of the of of the two characters, and hence your sort of uh, floating at part at points, not in all points in the book, but at points in the books into the fictional realm. Mm. No, I'm not going to be upfront. So that's I'm going to be a writer. <laughs> it will be more like a murder mystery. You know, who is this character? And then you discover that the character is actually two characters, <laughs> maybe even more. Uh, I had this I had this conversation with my historian friends because they it. it my friend Tim Gartenash, when I told him about this project, he was horrified. He said, this is horrible. You can't not tell people that you're actually not, you're lying. <laughs> and, uh, and I think it's part of the point that just as I was misled into believing in those files and into endorsing this interpretation that I was given by the files and so on, that the reader experiences the same. And if I 
say from the beginning, look, now I'm going to tell you about these two lives, but in a way that then I will disable, I will prevent them from living the same experience. And so I would deprive myself of a very powerful, I think, aesthetic tool. Too. So it's a form of p pathetic fallacy on a grand scale. Right, <laughs> on yeah. the entire book scale. Fascinating. Um, I saw a hand at the back there. Green is all I can see. Thank you so much for this. This was wonderful, and I can't wait to read the book. Um, Yulia Yurchenko, a fellow currently here. Um, you've appealed to a number of uh, complex and important concepts, um, but um, one thing that one of the, the thing that I want to start with is that the notion of universality, of course, is something that is uh, absolutely key to desubjectivize the notion of justice, right? Because justice can also be quite subjective, and in that sense, we cannot be talking in universal categories. So then once we move to the uh, concepts, uh, concept, once we accept that there is this universality, right, and then we move to accept that there, uh, art is hope, um, but art is a subjective category. Uh, the perception of beauty is a subjective notion, um, and so are the meanings of dignity in, in certain sense, of course, uh, which are a little bit easier. Of course, dignity is a bit easier to tie to universality than, uh, than beauty and art. But uh, art is also not always emancipatory or truthful. Art is, art is a mechanism of propaganda, and therefore practicing art in conditions of oppression of the subject of what constitutes their current freedom may not necessarily be an exercise of hope and emancipation, but rather further alienation and entrenchment of, um, of, of that alienation and oppression. So to me, it seems that there, there are some tensions there. And of course, it is difficult to talk about a book when you've only heard so little about it. So I'm, I'm more encouraging you to tell us more how you reconcile those tensions um, in your work. And one, one last thing I want to say is about the, the, dig the dead uh, and the dignity that we expect the dead to have. There is, um, of course, also pretend there is um, dignity in concealing the stories of the dead, who actually were quite indignant people, or pretending to be dead in order to not be further indignified by the system that is after you. So, um, yeah, and I, I'm just curious to, kind of to get you to entangle more uh, these complex dimensions, because I think it's really fascinating, and thank you for your project. Great, thank you. So I'm going to start with the first question, and maybe with this question of aesthetic. And I will I th I'll say some things where I, dis I agree with you and some things where I disagree. I think of aesthetic judgments as, yes, subjective, but in a way along the tradition of Kant and Schiller. What makes aesthetic judgments distinctive is that they are subjective, but they're also objective. They try to enact some kind of universality. So when I say, and, and, and Kant says, you know, when I say this is a beautiful work of art, I know that my, sub my impression is subjective, but I'm appealing to someone's potential agreement with that in a way that is different from when I say I like the sandwich, which is really just my taste and doesn't claim to uh, have another person agree with it. So I think of art in this tradition, which says, yes, it is a subjective, aesthetic experience is a subjective experience, but what makes it appeal to a notion of communication and agreement and seek agreement on the side of the public is that there is a kind of universality underpinning it, which has to do with this interplay of feelings and reason in the, in the uh, exhibition of the work of art. So it's kind of long, complicated discussion, but just to say that, and that is exactly why Kant and then especially Schiller thought that that's what makes art able to elevate us morally, that it has this connection to moral ideals, but in a way that isn't, uh, that is a bit softer and, and is more subjective and more attentive to other people's experiences and aesthetic uh, inhabiting of these positions. The second question, and having said that, I, uh, th and that takes me to the answer to your other question, which is about, is art always just propaganda? And I have to say no, starting from where I am. In part, I think, I mean, you know, we can't really settle that issue, but I think there are extremely oppressive societies where there is great art. Ismail Kadare, my own country, great Albanian writer, is a very good example of that, of someone who manages within this very repressive, very isolated communist society to write in his books an entire very sophisticated critique of the, the, the country in which he lives through symbols, through dreams, through a series of devices, 
which tells me that it can't be the case that art is just propaganda, that there is something, there is a potential there, which means that when the artists employ themselves, put themselves to the work, it can go beyond the propaganda. It's difficult, it's not always uh, straightforward, we know how funding of arts and culture works, we know what compromises people need to make, what kind of levels of complicity there are in the societies, even in kind of liberal societies, but I think I have to kind of hold that line, or at least it makes sense for my project to, to defend this principle that actually, no, it's not that all art is propaganda, and that there are ways through art of having critiques of society and embodying those critiques of society in the, in the works of art. So that's, uh, yeah, so that's the, the first question. The second question about dignity is actually also what led me to think about, you know, what do the dead have dignity? And again, if we think of dignity as something that comes with being human, with humanity, with a human's capacity for agency, as I put it in the book, uh, it again can't be that the dignity of someone is gone when they die. Because humanity is more than the physical human, more than the physical body, and more than the physical person that kind of lives at a particular time and place. And what you're trying to reconstruct with this discussion around the dignity of the dead is really uh, an effort to understand, okay, what is the dignity of the human? And it's about the person remaining human even when they're not a living being anymore. And that person remains human. And the fact that we have these conversations around how do we pay tribute to the dead or discussions around memory, the fact that we get really disturbed by cemeteries being destroyed, or, and indeed the fact that cemeteries are often a target for attacks of that kind shows us that it's exactly that the, the battle for dignity doesn't stop with the end of someone's life. And that's, again, what makes the project, I think, go in this direction of how do you think about and write about the dead. Uh, I'm going to come to the front row now. Uh, if we can, And then I'll go back to the back, and then I'll come to the front, and it's because I'm trying to distribute things as much as possible. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Lea, uh, for your talk uh, and the presentation. Um, my questions are coming from the historian's corner. Uh, I would be hesitant because, you know, I was expecting to be a uh, presentation on fiction and, and and I would be hesitant, but it seems that you are provoking historians and you also do re historical reconstruction in your, in your book. So, I mean, uh, yeah, I could be a little bit dogmatic because it's what we historians are when we are discussing with writers uh, <laughs> the historical fiction. Uh, I have two questions. I have many questions, but two I would pose. Um, one is, you said, and this, this concerns the broader framework, you said that uh, the French Revolution and then the democratic revolutions in Eastern Europe were about, th that, the, that there was a promise of justice. And I, I, I mean, could you elaborate on it? How, you know, because I don't really see it so much, you know. You know, this, you know, 1989 is a uh, coming to terms, like it's, it's, it's the final crushing down of one of the biggest, actually not the biggest, uh, uh, social justice uh, political projects in history. So uh, there were rights, uh, getting back rights. There was like democratic and civic empowerment, dignity. Yes, like this was a revolution of dignity, but of justice. You know, justice. How? How do you? How do you mm. uh, explain it? And related question is the reconciliation thing, right? I mean, you said that there. May but maybe this is not important. But you said that there is this. There was this hope in these societies that. Uh, opening archives and seeing the truth will lead to reconciliation. But when we look at the discussions, the political discussions around illustrations, around opening of the files, um, opening the archives of secret police, uh, you know, it, it was the other way around. I mean, those, you know, those people who were opening, including us historians for the opening, were uh, going for through truth, but they would never, at the same in the same breath, speak about possible reconciliation. We knew, and they knew that this is going to cut through the societies. We, you know, these societies went completely different way than the uh, South African uh, Truth and Lick Reconciliation Commissions, that the, the, the models, the legal ways of dealing with the communist authoritarian mind was very, very different from uh, sou Southern Africa. And then the camps that were discussing the uh, possible re uh, reconciliation and opening of the, of, of the file, they were exactly on the opposite sides, right? Reconciliation guys uh, would say, don't open it because this is a Pandora box uh, because, you know, this, this was based on lies and we never come out of it. And many people think this way up until today. Whereas the other was like, that it's there, th we have the materials, we have to open it because otherwise it will be always politically used and we know how the compromise really works. So, yeah, but, you know, truth or reconciliation, mm -hmm. not both. Thank you. Yeah. 
Yeah, great, thank you. So maybe I'll start with the with the last question. I think you're right, and in a way, this is what uh, in Albania, which is going through this more or less now, or has been going with a delay for for a while. But the the question is always yes, but truth can be instrumental to reconciliation because no one wants to give up on reconciliation. I mean, being in a democracy, being a democratic agent, means that somehow you have to be. Uh, aligned to the kind of system of values and everyone has to share the system of values and somehow there has to be a process of recognition in the political system. Part of my criticism, and this goes back maybe to some of the questions, to some of the answers that I was giving to, uh, to Michael earlier, I am personally not convinced that these societies are capable of having reconciliation just because they don't have in place the mechanisms of combining political justice, social justice, freedom, equality that enables democracy to be fully functioning. So I think democracies are distorted and reconciliation is more of a kind of ideal that of unity that is always presupposed there and plays a rhetorical function but is itself somehow manipulated. But the discourse is that, you know, you get the truth, that the truth and reconciliation are not uh, incompatible because no one is going out saying actually these things are incompatible. This, the whole uh, project is to have truth and then to have truth so that you can have finally reconciliation, but with the idea that the society that we live under is the just society. And what I'm trying to say with Schiller is, well, if you don't think it's the just society, then the whole thing com becomes much more complicated because who is having a say on how these processes should be conducted and whose truth is being served with this search for truth and how can you ever get out of this propaganda and manipulation cycle. On the, uh, on the first question, I think I have a slightly different reading because as I read the revolutions of 1989, I mean, I think you have a more of a kind of the, the reconstruction of these events that we, that was in some ways handed to us after the neoliberal turn of these societies, which really did end up with a kind of destruction of social justice and giving up on this idea that, um, that, there, that there can be something like political justice on the one hand, which we didn't have, but also social justice, some of which we did have. And as I see it, a lot of the revolutions of 1989, ha including Havel, were actually saying, well, we have to have both of these things. We shouldn't give up on one or the other. It's only afterwards, with the hindsight, that we see that we actually did give up on one and we just ended up with a kind of full neoliberal version. But I don't think in the moment of these movements, in, in, in the moment where they were promising, which is what I was talking about, the promise of these movements, in the moment of promise, there was this tension. I think the two things were seen as going alongside each other, that going for political justice wouldn't necessarily have to sacrifice uh, uh, social justice. It was more about freedom of thought, freedom of association, freedom of movement, manifestation, free speech, and so on. These were the kind of paradigmatic liberal freedoms, but it didn't have to mean that you also have to privatize and destroy childcare, whatever you had in place in the social welfare, whatever form of welfare uh, these societies had in place. And I don't think these movements ever saw themselves as we're going for political freedom and then we will also destroy uh, social justice. I think they thought, well, we can have both, and maybe they were wrong, but that's where I thought that, that where their promise was. Thanks. I'm going to go to the middle now, because I saw Till had his hand up there, so we're going to the middle bit, and then we'll go back to the back. So thank you so much. Um, um, absolutely intriguing, both as, as an uh, uh, exercise in thought and as literature, um, I'm I'm sort of struggling with Schiller and the beauty and the art because there's another way of uh, of thinking about aesthetics, and that is to think about sensory experiences more generally. So then the sublime and the beauty and the art comes into play, but it's just one form among many others of making these sensory experiences that I would think are fundamental two ideas about dignity, justice, freedom, equality. So then what would happen if you, if you um, not necessarily abandon Schiller, but take, in, take into consideration a kind of thinking about aesthetics that comes out of a democratic tradition? Emerson, Whitman, Dewey, uh, Stanley Cavell, and e all of these people were trying to understand the centrality of sensory experiences in which art can play a fundamental role, art as experience, uh, but tie it to a much broader conception of even, even sort of social political transformation, uh, which may answer the, the concern that emphasizing art uh, is, is a kind of um, escapism 
in, in, in the contemporary world. But I mean, it, it's just a little suggestion that may help you sharpen your, your both the argument and the way you can frame the argument as literature. Mm. But I don't want to. <laughs> I don't want to abandon Schiller and, and Kant and so on. <laughs> and I don't want to abandon the link between art and morality, because I think what gives art its at least. I mean, not all of art. I'm not denying that there are forms of art that are purely expressive, purely sensory. The kind of art that I am interested in is politically committed art. And what roots it to politics is some notion of what is the right thing to do. And that and the answer that there is a way of thinking about right and wrong, that it isn't all subjective, that it doesn't all depend on just whatever people like, that there are... And so in, in that sense, it's much... It's different from the more postmodern takes of the kind of Cavell. I think art, when you press it politically, there's two ways it can go. It can either go Schiller and Kant, or it can go Nietzsche. And I'm reluctant to go with the Nietzschean answer because I think it comes with a very high political cost, and we actually know the cost. It comes with a, this kind of aestheticism that then ended up being a part of important um, experiences of the 20th century, not all of which were happy experiences. So I think I'm sort of... Uh, when you press this pragmatic tradition that you mentioned, Dewey and so on, as I say, they, at some point you have, they have to jump. And I, I decided that I've made the jump already, and I've jumped the kind of art and morality connection, and I'm not going back. <laughs> but I'm very willing to be persuaded. It's just that I haven't heard an argument yet for giving up completely on this connection. And again, I want to emphasize, I'm not saying that all art should have to have some connection to politics and should be moral. There's lots of other kinds of arts that you can have about, you know, self-expression, narration. There's all other functions that it plays. But if you're doing it with a social purpose, then I think it's really hard to detach it completely from this tradition. Uh, at the b back, I see a hand there. Yep. Yeah, thank you so much. I really enjoyed that. Um, I um, I have a question about form, uh, and I'm asking this both as an artist and researcher. I'm a fellow here at IBM as well. Um, so you, um, would you say the experience of writing this book has been one of carving out a form? for yourself? Because you talk at the beginning about the role that art and literature can play, but would you say it's an argument in as much about what actually academia and research at its best can be and find ways to produce knowledge in more expansive, deep, nuanced uh, ways that allow for all of this much more political conversation that brings us towards more liberation rather than harm? So yeah. Thoughts on form would be great. Mm -hmm. thank you. Yeah, great. Thank you. So I think um, I, I think of it as, as I said earlier, I have a kind of philosophy mode of writing and then a more literary mode of writing. And I think of them as tempering each other. So when you're writing f as an academic from a philosophical uh, standpoint, you're usually starting out by saying, I have a thesis and I want to convince the audience that my thesis is right and all the objections are rubbish. And that is devastating for literature. If you start writing literary text like that, you just end up with basically, yeah, in the worst forms of so socialist realism, basically, where you have an author that has a good guy and then there's the bad guys and just end up writing this caricature. So what you have to do, and this is where the form is really important, as I said, you have to inhabit all these different characters so that you can reproduce the dialogue and you can reproduce the tensions. But I think both of them have a role to play because I don't think literature by itself leads you to have an answer. And I sometimes want to have an answer when I'm writing. I want to know, okay, but what, where, where am I going? Where is this, what is the purpose of my work? And philosophy gives me that purpose. On the other hand, the risk is that philosophy gives you that purpose, but it, re it renders you oblivious to how the, your purpose is experienced in a way and to the different tensions in society. And, and I think that's a loss as well. And in fact, the whole criti the criticism of Schiller and of Kant of the French Revolution was exactly that, that these revolutionaries, they just went there and they were convinced of their ideas and they didn't care about how people experienced the uh, ideas and, th and ended up being a terrible mess. So I, th I think of them as complementary. And as I say, I think of literary form as helping me ask questions and of philosophical form as helping me answer questions and they do it differently and press against each other but when they work they they, they also complement each other you want to thank you very much uh, yeah. thank you very much I, I must say I'm fascinated by your talk and uh, like the gentleman before I'm also very intrigued to it and uh, in the same vein I 
I'm intrigued by the way you see art as a vehicle for morality. I, um, uh, apart from the fact that I think that the French Revolution is one of the best things that happened to the world, uh, really, I do, um, I think also that, that the art forms we were talking about, uh, it's very symptomatic. I mean, we were talking about German philosophers and we were talking about uh, uh, authors in the Anglo-Saxon tradition. I think the, and, and you know it, the French and the Italian artists have an, a completely different take, less moralizing take, on literature and philosophy, I mean, I, I mean Baudelaire and, and Verlaine and and other and the musicians. I think uh, with uh, with the music we we enter an art form which is devoid of m morality to a large extent. So you have given an answer in part already to say you are interested, and I take it it's very legitimate. You are interested in an art form that supports a certain form of morality, but. Um, since the, the topic, uh, and I was very attracted by the topic, is can beauty save the world? C can't you imagine that there are other forms of beauties that can save us in different ways, either individually, which I wouldn't call escapism necessarily, or collectively, and then we enter the realm of things like the French call a national novel, that gives you identity and purpose beyond uh, daily political uh, struggles. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. So I'm, I think I don't see them as, I mean, I, I agree that there are different ways of approaching art, but I wouldn't say that they are divided by nationality in the way in which you've r r depicted them. I mean, there are a lot of, there's plenty of authors in the German tradition that would resist this, just as there are plenty of authors in the French tradition that would go with a more, and indeed one of the champions of politically committed art is Jean-Paul Sartre. So there are a lot of, there is a lot of, so it goes both ways, and it, it, it travels both ways. My title was intentionally provocative, and it actually comes from this line in the, in the, in the Idiot in Dostoevsky, where he raises this question, can beauty save the world? And, uh, and, and in a way, that's also his challenge. And again, Dostoevsky wasn't necessarily someone who was writing art for political purposes, but was one of the most effective ones at conveying the spirit of an era. So I think it's not that you always have to intend to be moral or to be political or to be politically engaged to produce work that ends up playing that function. If you're aware of it, good. But in a way, the, I think the magic of art is that you don't even have to have that. It can just somehow, it's part of the creative process. And uh, and as I say, I don't know that I have a, a, a kind of definitive answer to that because these are all, I think, perfectly legitimate ways of expressing ourselves. And depends on you know what which questions are more relevant and less relevant depends on who is posing the question and for what purpose. And and the other thing about art is that unlike philosophy, it is very aware of the particularity of the position from which the questions are being raised. Whereas with philosophy, you have much more of a, a deceitful attitude because a lot of philosophers think they speak for humanity when they present their theories. And I think artists are much more modest in, in that way. And I, I like the fact that they are more modest. And at least with this project, it, it is more modest, even though the other stuff is more ambitious. Clemena. I thank you, thank you very much. I thought this was a really interesting talk. And I, I thought it was fascinating that you started your initial project was to use the archives and write about a concrete person, your grandmother. And then you end up with fiction. So in a way, your, the whole connection between ethics and art is already there in the structure of your writing. That fiction, in a way, is a better and more truthful way of reconstructing this era than actually if you stick concretely to the archives and the facts. And I find this very interesting. Now, I don't want to go on. There's been a lot of bashing of Schiller here, I feel. But i like to just say something I've been thinking uh, about quite a lot. I'm an art historian. And somehow, I've always found that art is burdened with so much that is not even an aspect of what is it, it is trying to achieve. Mm -hmm. You know, and I think that in defense of Schiller and the Romantics, I think that they don't mean 
types of art, art which is politically engaged or art which is moral, the way I understand them, they mean something about the structure of the aesthetic experience itself. Like Schopenhauer talks about how art raises you above time and space and whatever. But I think what is interesting and relevant there is the connection between art and the idea of universalist project. Now, if beauty is meant to save the world, there are very different ways in which people think they may save the world, through a revolution, through violence, through um, a moral project, and so on. So I think that art in itself is not necessarily connected to morality. You can make exactly the opposite case. So it seems to me that for your project, which I think is so interesting to go about it in this way, somewhere at the beginning or at the end, or I don't know where, there should be a way in which you really explain to readers like myself, because I definitely plan to read your book, what exactly, you, how you understand the connection between art and ethics that you're drawing. And I think that a lot of the comments show that people keep wondering about that. You know, I, I, I'm working now on the Soviet avant-garde. These were people who, in the first years after the revolution were very committed to the revolution. So when Michael said that he's on the side of artists rather than revolutionaries, very often they were the same people. Mayakovsky was a revolutionary and a great poet and artist. So yeah, so these are some thoughts. It's not really so much a question, but mm -hmm. probably you could tell me how you see the connection between art and uh, ethics. Mm. Yeah, I think actually in, in a way that is similar to how you describe the aesthetic and the ethical experience. And so I, I think I agree with you that what's the, where you see the potential productive connection between the two is in the way in which the kind of ethical, ex uh, sorry, the aesthetic experience connects to the ethical via the production or indeed the enjoyment of the works of art as Kant and Schiller wrote. I think, though, that something was lost in the kind of development of the cultural world, and I don't want to call it the postmodern turn and so on. The connection between art and ethics, which was taken for granted, even by, you know, by Schiller, by Kant, they didn't have to be politically engaged. They didn't have, Schiller didn't have to be a politically engaged writer to reflect on the role of ethics for his writing. But I think at some point there was a disruption of that, and that's where I'm sort of trying, this is what I'm also trying to recover, which is not to say that art should be ex explicitly political and that you should write a work of art that is just an interpretation of a kind of political take on the world, but I think the, it needs to recover somehow this sense that actually the ethical is part of the aesthetic experience. And I think that was lost. It was there and it was taken for granted. And so when we say, well, it wasn't political, it wasn't political because it was implicitly always ethical. It stopped being ethical at some point when, you know, we know all the discussions both in, in history of art, in history of literature, with the kind of postmodern turn and so on. And I think something was lost at that point, which I feel maybe less in literature, certainly in more in visual arts. And something like that, I think, is important and, and drives the project forward o just at that level, not really at the level of saying, well, it's not a political art in that it's not, it doesn't have an interpretation of the world on how we should s solve historical injustice or how it should... There is that interpretation amongst many other things going on in the book, but the book's purpose is not just to give you that take on the world. It's more, it, 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 it's more of a sense of conveying these different perspectives. Um, I think we've got time for one more question. I've seen hands at the back, right in the far back there, desperately trying to uh, make themselves felt, so they deserve. Thanks so much. I really enjoyed this. I'm Holly uh, Case, and I'm a fellow here. And uh, my question is about, because I loved the framing that you had with uh, Schiller at the beginning, um, and how you talked about the 89s and the resonance between the two. And I was wondering, because uh, there's a tension somehow between this notion that there's a right, you know, that there's a resonant time, you know, that, that this has its season, this kind of intervention, but also, you know, the universality, which implies a kind of trans-historical validity. And I was wondering if uh, you think, uh, you know, how you see art in light of this, you know, there's a right time for it to make its, uh, its, uh, um, its intervention, especially in politics, whereas in other times the same approach might 
like be bad for politics? Um, or is the approach that you uh, speak of with the um, the uh, internal freedom, do you see that as having a trans-historical validity or a kind of chaos type validity? Thank you. So yeah, I think the in the end, the conception of freedom that I'm more persuaded by is trans-historical and is transcendental and is universal. So, but the particular, but the interpretations of it are historical. So there is a kind of ideal of of human moral human relations, but the interpretations are always concrete and always particular and always situated. And the tension always comes in the trying to understand the efforts that are made at interpreting these ideals and the types of society that they lead us to imagine or to fight or to criticize, and where we start with. So I think that, having said that, I don't think that there is a particular time where you know art of, of this kind or literature of this kind is more or less productive. I do think that there is something to be said for times of crisis where there is, in general, much less settled. So the, I, I think in, it depends on how we think about history and philosophy of history, but I do think that I, I'm personally in favor of also talking about history in these more broad brushes and with this more philosophical perspective. And I think in moments of crisis, in particular this post-revolutionary crisis, you experience usually an effort to revive and to have certain conversations amongst artists precisely because there is a kind of disillusionment with moral ideas that become political ideas without intermediaries, as it were. And so it's not a coincidence that you then get in the aftermath of the French Revolution all these discussions around the betrayals and notwithstanding, I agree with you that it is one of the greatest things to have happened. So, but having acknowledged the productive contribution of certain political events, you have to also be aware of the remainders and of the tragedies and the particular, uh, what they cause at the particular level. And art, I think, captures those experiences maybe in a way that is more effective than philosophies or theories that to some extent have led people to this crisis and to this type of disillusionment. So I don't know, I mean, that's not a, I'm not sure that I have a kind of settled answer to that, just to say that maybe in moments of crisis, there may be something to be said for this type of conversation, and that might also explain why these types of conversations become uh, more prominent. And indeed, also, this is also just getting out of the kind of Western liberal societies. It's not a coincidence that you see, when you think about decolonial struggles, or if you think about countries more at the kind of periphery of intellectual debates, often they discover thought through literature, or through art. They don't have necessarily systems. I mean, some, Albania doesn't really have any systematic philosopher. But what you do get is ways in which philosophy is filtered through these exter experiences that are more artistic and more, more situated somehow. And I think that's maybe not a coincidence either. Well, Leia, I think this discussion has become richer and richer as the evening has drawn on. Uh, all thanks to you and, of course, the uh, penetrating <laughs> questions. Thank you. Big round of applause. And because you have um, created this fertile environment, I think it's appropriate that we all go downstairs and continue the discussions over a glass of wine and some nibbles. So thank, thank you very you. much, Leah. Thanks. That was great. Thank you. Yeah.